go ahead and get started. I want to thank everyone for coming to the first of our um, three lectures in the series Primate Perspectives. Just a reminder that next week on Wednesday, we have Barry Albright from the University of North Florida presenting. And on the 27th, we have um, Nelson Ting from the University of Oregon giving a talk. But tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francis White. Dr. White is a primatologist from the University of Oregon who studies the evolution of social behavior in non-human primates. She has a BA and an MA in natural sciences from Cambridge University and a PhD in ecology and evolution from Stony Brook University. She has studied bonobos of the Lomako forest in the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1983 and has also conducted field work on monkeys, lemurs, and macaques. Francis is an associate professor of anthropology and the director of the Institute for Cognitive and Decision Sciences. She teaches classes in primate behavior and ecology on the evolution of human sexual sexuality and biological statistics. She also provides research opportunities for undergraduate students to study the Museum of Natural and Cultural History's comparative primate osteology collection of over 600 primate skeletons housed in her lab in Condon Hall. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Francis White. I'd like to thank everyone from coming, for coming. Can you hear me okay? What's the volume like in the back? Louder, or is it okay? <laughs> Bit louder? Okay. I can try and stay by the mic if it's working, or tell me to stop and speak up. Otherwise, it's interesting. This is always the week where um, people get very interested in, in the kind of work that I do, especially on sexual behavior and the evolution of uh, social systems and the role that sex plays in those in non-human primates because the bonobo is such a very different animal to every other primate and it really has changed the picture of what we think about when we think about the evolution of humans and of course during Valentine's Day week this is a, a perfect time to be talking about it and also this is the term where I teach my evolution of human sexuality class. We always aim to do something very special for that class on, on Valentine's Day. It's an interesting uh, set of questions and in a very, for me, uh, fun way to think about humans when we really bring in our evolutionary history and tie it to what we know from modern living primates. So, if we're thinking about this in terms of reconstructing what a human ancestor looked like, we'd be talking about an animal that was around five to seven million years ago and is something that is represented now by its modern descendants, which is us and our closest ape relatives, which are the chimpanzee and the bonobo. And here we have a bonobo. It's actually an, a, a, a very amusing picture as well because this is a bonobo using an artificial termite mound. So it's a termite mound that's been constructed in a zoo exhibit, and they are fishing for a reward. In the wild, they would fish for termites, so they make tools and extract termites from these mounds, but this one is fishing for jam, which has been inserted into tubes inside this mound. But it's something that things like tool use and uh, other sorts of behaviors that we see in chimpanzees and bonobos it, it's an easy extension to understand the evolution of these behaviors in modern humans. So we talk about things like uh, tool use, tool production, manufacture of a tool set. It's fairly easy then to say, okay, this makes sense, and if they have it, we have the same traits, or we would have had, our ancestors would have the same traits. But when you get to sexuality, it often gets a bit strange. But what we're trying to do is think about the traits that are associated with sexual behavior in chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans, and I'm going to be focusing obviously on bonobos today, and think about why those behaviors evolved. In other words, this would provide us with essentially the evolutionary reasons for the sexual behavior that we see, and then it is possible that we could infer 
possible sexual behavior of modern humans and what the evolutionary origins might have been. People have been doing this for a long time. Right? And when we talk about sex and sexual behavior, we're talking about humans, it, it's part of a larger question on human mating systems. So trying to think about or trying to reconstruct the ancestral human mating system and what does that tell us about our evolutionary history. The two things that come up when we talk about sex and sexual behavior is trying to tie this with the modern concept of love or as we would call it from an animal behavior perspective, social bonding between individuals. So for a long time, people have tried to reconstruct the evolutionary history of uh, a, an ancestral mating system for humans. And there are a number of features that we can identify as true, both because what we know about modern humans and what we know about the fossil record, that tell us something about where, the way the social system worked. So if we talk about reconstructed modern humans, as here's a reconstruction, one of the things that's particular about humans that uh, is a trait that's not shared by all other primates is we tend to have a very large-brained and highly dependent offspring. Now, when you have a, a large-brained offspring, it needs a lot of energy, it needs a lot of food, and it needs a lot of care. Human infants are less independent than all other uh, mammals. They are fairly dependent in terms of comparing to, to modern primates. Primate infants are also fairly dependent, but humans just take it that much further. It takes a lot longer for a human infant to become an independent, functional adult. And during that time, they need to be looked after in some way. They need to be given food and they need to be protected. So the need for providing this extra food would fall on, first of all, the mother, right? So you talk about lactation, breastfeeding, producing milk. But after weaning, there's still a requirement for a lot of food for this infant. Growing a brain is energetically very expensive. So your brain takes up to 30% of your base energy budget that essentially is taken right off the top. So growing one is really, really expensive. And that's more food than a single individual can generally provide. When you start looking at those animals, and there are some primate examples that we can use here, for what happens when you have an infant that's more dependent, which one that needs extra care, more than a female can provide, you typically get others caring. If it's very dependent, then it's typically paternal care. The father cares for the infant as well as the mother. And the elements that are often uh, suggested or hypothesized to be an important part here for human ancestors is going to be provisioning, especially the provisioning of meat that's gained through scavenging and hunting. So that essentially that you take on a hypothesis that as the infant gets more and more dependent, the male needs to provide more and more care. What you are moving away from is a system where the male doesn't provide care, so each female represents a mating opportunity and then he mates with that female, he can then go mate with another female. If the infant is highly dependent, if he did that, if he mated with that female and left, the infant would not survive. So from an evolutionary perspective, it pays the male to stay and care for that infant in order to have offspring. So you have essentially going towards a system of male care, male staying with females, and this is often then mixed into this argument of what is the, the ancestral system. You need a closely bonded male and female working cooperatively to raise a heavily dependent and therefore relatively expensive offspring. The other things that then go along with this are elements of paternal certainty. So males typically are only expected to invest in offspring if they are clearly theirs. So this also goes with a pair bonded or a monogamous system where males are mating with only one female, females are mating with only one male. That also is a, a requirement for uh, high levels of male care. The other part of the picture, and part of these get fairly complicated, but I want to start out with this uh, historic perspective of how people used to think about the evolution of the human mating system is it's pointed out that humans, if you look at them from the outside, 
uh, seem to have concealed ovulation. That is, early workers uh, looking at people and thinking about people compared to primates said, primates don't have huge sexual swellings, they're not advertising when they're ovulating, therefore you cannot tell by looking at a female when she's ovulating, when she's fertile. And these early hypotheses then suggested that the human mating system was one that was geared towards sexual interaction between the male and the female because the male could not tell when the female was ovulating. Right? So you extend the time for sex outside of the time of ovulation, either because the male needs to mate frequently because it's not clear when ovulation happens, or because sex is actually for social bonding to keep the pair together and to invest in their shared offspring. So this is sort of the framework that was uh, established fairly early on to talk about what is the evolution of the human mating system, the idea that it's um, a sex-based co uh, cohesion between a pair, between a male and a female, to keep them together, to care for this dependent offspring associated with sex outside of the time of ovulation. That social system, right, which we call a monogamous or pair-bonded social system, is an interesting one, and we use, and this, the hypothesis was used primate examples to develop this particular model. So a classic example for uh, a human uh, male care of infants is the small New World monkey that's shown down on the bottom. Right? This is a monkey that is relatively small. Now, when you're very small, by small I mean they're less than a kilogram, so little things more like the size of a squirrel. The smaller and smaller you get, the bigger your infant tends to be in terms of proportion to an adult. So an infant, these are little marmosets, marmosets and tamarins, the, the group that have really small, the really small primates with very large infants, also tend to have twins and triplets. So two to three infants at a time, all needing care and all needing to be carried around. And that's too much work for the mother to do. So with a typical social system, includes monogamy, and there are a lot of them are monogamous, where you have a male and a female who share the care of the infants. And in fact, this one is most likely a male because he's carrying the infants. The female primarily produces the milk and they return to her to get milk, but the male is doing the work of carrying the infants around. So it, essentially, the argument is the more the infant needs the male to survive, the more likely you would have pair bonding or monogamy. The less infant care you, that's needed, the more males should mate with a female and then leave and seek other matings. So the degree of monogamy or the degree of mating with multiple females depends on the level of care that the infants need. Uh, and it's interesting then in terms of this applies to humans because people have then extended this to look at individuals' behaviors and choices. So for example, if an individual is making a mating choice dependent on uh, or, or with the goal of rearing offspring, right? So uh, let, me, let me give you the example, and perhaps this will become a little bit more obvious, that if you're thinking about it, if two individuals are going to have sex, are they going to decide to have sex or not, depending on whether there's an offspring involved? So from this type of model, we would say that... If, there's less, if there isn't an infant involved, you would expect males to have sex with lots of females. The female perspective is slightly different. If the, from the female's perspective, you expect her to be relatively choosy. So her choice of males won't be necessarily to choose a male that is going to be good at investing in infants, but it would have to be a good quality genetic male in case there was an infant, right? Because the high cost of infant production rests with the female. So when you apply this to humans, this is the sort of thing that you get. And this is a graph showing across the bottom time known. Now on the uh, axis, on the point closest to me, that says five years, right? And it reads across the markers, five years, two years, one year, six months, three months, one month, one week, one day, one evening, one hour, okay? And the axis up the side is likelihood of intercourse. And this is people, right? This is asking people what's the likelihood you'd have sex with someone based on knowing them for an hour, an evening, a day, a week, and so on. 
The two lines are males, which is the upper line, and females, which is the lower line. Right? So what you've got here is that if you're just talking about sex and not investing in infants, males are much more willing to engage in sexual interactions. Females are much choosier. Right? This is what you would expect if there isn't a, the goal of producing a dependent offspring. However, as you get more and more to what is presumably a long-term relationship and thinking about starting a family and so on, both converge on the same point because both are getting choosy. They're both choosing high investing individuals in each other. This is just another example of it. This one is a similar sort of thing. This is asking about individuals, how likely are they li uh, to have sex? And in terms of um, the acceptability of the potential mate. So the ones across the bottom are closest to me is date, casual sex, steady date, and marriage partner, right? So is this someone you'd have sex with? Is this someone you'd have casual sex with? Is this someone you would date? Is this someone you would marry? And up the uh, axis going up is the minimum acceptable intelligence, right? As a measure of human quality. So in other words, the females, which are the line that sort of is fairly straight across, is mm, fairly uh, equivalent to males except in one category, and that is the casual sex one, right? So when it is potentially establishing a relationship, investing in offspring, both males and females are choosy, but when it's just sex, the males' standards have dropped, let us say. <laughs> So this is sort of the way that we take predictability about behavior of primates and apply it to humans. One of the, uh, well, there have been many things that then emerge from the studies of primates that then feed back to this original hypothesis, this original idea that love and sex for monogamous bonding in humans happens because of the need of the male and the female to stay together, either because the male can't detect ovulation or because they're socially bonded together. As a general hypothesis, right, for the evolution of the human mating system, one of the problems is what, that if you look at non-human primates, some of the bits of this puzzle fall apart. So here, for example, are gibbons, which are small apes. And gibbons are monogamous, as are the marmosets and tamarins that we talked about before. If you look across monogamous animals, what you find is that sex is actually a rare event. Sex happens when the female's ovulating, and she only ovulates between successfully rearing each offspring. Right? So she will ovulate, the male and the female will mate for a very brief period until uh, fertilization happens. The female rears the infant, she lactates, and only when she finishes producing milk does she ovulate again. So sex is basically a few hours every couple of years or so. Right? There isn't sexual behavior that's happening at any other time. So frequent sexual behavior and monogamy are not linked in all animals. They only seem to be suggested in this, these hypotheses as happening in humans, all other monogamous animals actually cut down the frequency of sex compared to primates with other social systems. The other thing that was a big sort of critique in the original yeah. idea that sex, constant sex but in humans, or sex outside of ovulation evolved because of ovulation being concealed, is that we now know that human ovulation is highly advertised. So that even though individuals may not be consciously aware that they're ovulating, they are radiating signals. So this is shown whether you do the famous t-shirt experiments. That is, you have individuals wear plain t-shirts wearing no uh, deodorant or nothing that would affect their odor. So females wear t-shirts for a day. They're then put in a plastic bag and offered to different males, and they're asked, which is the most attractive female? What will they do? What will males do? They'll pick out the ovulating female right, from smell. You can do this with many aspects of humans, both in terms of pheromones they're producing, as well as in physical appearance, so that people have actually done it to the level of showing a one-inch square picture of cheek skin and saying to males, again, which is the most attractive female, 
without the males knowing this is the same person, right? So this is skinned a photograph of the a square inch of a person's cheek. And what the males would do is say, that's the most attractive person, and that's that woman when she's ovulating. In other words, you may not know you're doing it, but we're all able to detect ovulation. It's also been shown that females, women, when they're ovulating, change their behaviors in different ways. So that it doesn't have to be conscious in order to be advertised. So there's a lots of data that shows that human ovulation is advertised. We also know from looking at modern humans throughout the globe that monogamy is not the standard marriage pattern. In fact, if you look at societies around the world, 85 or more percent of them are not monogamous. So that we have to question whether we would argue that the modern human mating system is monogamous. It's also true that if you look inside populations of humans that say culturally that they are monogamous, their behavior is often not monogamous. Uh, so in general, this whole argument of trying to tie things together to monogamy and dependent offspring gets really complicated. It also gets complicated if you look at modern hunter-gatherers. So in modern hunter-gatherers, obviously these are not human ancestors, but they are modern humans solving modern day problems. But many of them are in ecological conditions that would have been similar to those occupied by our uh, modern human ancestors. But if you look at modern hunter-gatherers, males who hunt don't provision their infants any more than they provision other individuals' infants. In fact, in most of the societies, hunted food is shared equally among all individuals. It's not preferentially given to individuals or to their own offspring. One thing that you do see, though, in many of these societies, that males who are highly successful hunters are preferred sex partners. In other words, it doesn't seem to be, at least in the modern societies, that it's hunting to provision infants, but rather hunting as male advertisement. So it gets very complicated, and the whole picture is not a simple one. It's also uh, complicated by differences between male and female choices, and we'll talk about some of these things as we go along, about what males do influences what females do, and what females do influences what males do. But it also was a model that was built up to begin with using chimpanzees as models, because they were the first close human relative that was studied. It was originally very hard to study apes, and, and chimpanzees were the ones that were most successfully studied to begin with. And it's uh, interesting, because in the grand scheme of primates, chimpanzees are relatively high on the aggression scale. Now, in all of these cases, it's not that any one animal is all one thing or, or, or all another, but in terms of the frequency of behaviors and the way the societies work, aggression and dominance and fighting is a major part of being a chimpanzee. Here's an example of uh, a male chimpanzee in the back is charging at a female chimpanzee. She's giving a fear grimace and running away, and she has an infant on her front as well. So when you use models, as uh, guides to trying to reconstruct what humans are like. You're not supposed to be saying, this is a human ancestor and we try to build a human society out of it, but it creeps in. It inevitably creeps in because this is the only example that uh, people were aware of at the time. In terms of chimpanzees as a social system then, if we think about them in terms of uh, what sorts of things kind of bleed through into these reconstructions of, of modern humans. Just to sort of summarize what a chimpanzee social system is like, the females are relatively solitary. They, it's not like they're alone, because they always have their offspring with them. And for a chimpanzee, that means an infant, and probably a juvenile, and probably an adolescent. So it's sort of like a little family group of four, or maybe more, uh, depending on how big her offspring are, that will go around together. But they don't find out and look for and hang out with other females that much. In general, each female has her own area. If there's a nice fruit tree that will support a lot of individuals in an area that overlaps between females, certainly they'll come together. 
but they're not socially bonded. Each female is sort of like a little solitary element with lots of them ranging around inside the uh, community of this particular group of chimpanzees. So you've got what we would call socially not bonded individuals. They associate, but they don't seek each other out and they don't stay together. So they're often, uh, females are often alone with their dependent offspring. The males, in contrast, in chimpanzees are highly social with each other. So you get a lot of male-male uh, friendly behaviors. And the males work together to uh, hold this area that con contains all of these females. So the males are highly social, they're highly cooperative. Each male is also uh, dominant to the females, but males are also rarely alone. They're often socially together with other males. So if, for example, you had males and females arriving at this tree at the first time uh, to begin with, in chimpanzees, the males would feed first, and the females would only feed when the males are done. Right? It's a female-dominated social system, and a lot of the interactions are mediated through aggression. So males will aggress against females, they will uh, beat them up, they will uh, aggress against them when the female is ready to mate so that the female mates with those particular males. Females often spend a lot of time avoiding males. This aggression then can also get extended outside of the community. So we talk about a chimpanzee, uh, all of the individuals in the group we call a community because they're all sort of wandering around doing their own thing, but they're all within the same area, and it's the males that determine the limits of that area, the borders of that range. And those males that defend this range, what are they defending them from? They're defending them from the neighbors. And males and chimpanzees will uh, work together to defend, either through shouts but also through fights, their females and their home range from the neighbors. But they go another step further, and that is they will go into the neighboring range, especially when they sense or they can find a group of males from the neighboring community that's in a smaller group than their group, and they will attack those males and potentially kill them. So lethal raiding, that is the attacking of one group of males by another group of males between communities is something that's been seen in chimpanzees. So much of the structuring that goes on within the communities is based very much on aggressive interactions. So that sort of... Uh, building blocks was often built into many of the ideas of thinking about modern humans. So sort of coming from that and trying to go towards a monogamous system. And I think that's partly why a lot of things got built in early on to say things like, well, females are concealing ovulation to trick males to be around for constant sex because they don't know when to have sex and then leave. And then by keeping the male around, you got the males provisioning uh, from supplying meat. But we now know all those bits don't work. Those, all those parts uh, are not consistent, at least with what we see in modern animals and modern people today. So it's really useful that we have another comparator. We have another model, and that's the bonobo. Bonobos are chimpanzees. It's a, type of, it's a species of chimpanzee. They look similar but different. The, the, I think the differences are relatively subtle. So this is a bonobo on the left and a chimpanzee on the right. Chimpanzees are born with pale faces, as you can see from that infant, and relatively big ears that stick out. Their faces turn darker as they get older. Bonobos are always have dark faces, so they're born with dark faces. Their ears are relatively small. You can't actually see them, and they have this wonderful hairstyle, which is sort of parted in the middle. Uh, which is particular to bonobos. There's a few other differences, but they are relatively subtle. There's slightly difference in, in body shape. Chimpanzees are sort of shorter and stockier. Chim uh, bonobos uh, sort of have longer limbs and are more gracile uh, as they spend more time in the trees than do chimpanzees, which live mostly on the ground. So they're very similar, but still relatively different. I should also say that, of course, as we're talking about sex for sexual behavior, I will be, uh, I've got a couple of video clips I'd like to show you, just some uh, typical bonobo behavior, so uh, sexual behavior, but um, I'm assuming everybody's comfortable with that, and I'm also going to uh, suggest if you're interested about bonobos and bonobo sociality uh, and the studies that we've done over the years, that this is a really good uh, film that, the, that Nova made called The Last Great Ape, and it's 
here in the Knight Library if you uh, want to check it out. But this little uh, warning comes from that video, and it's my, one of my favorite parts of that video. The interesting thing about chimpanzees and bonobos is they come from different parts of Africa, right? You'd never find a place where they overlap. So chimpanzees are very relatively common. There's several different subspecies, and they're, th they're found throughout uh, West and Central and into East Africa. And bonobos are found only in the center part of the Congo Basin. So the bonobos are, well, the color's not coming out very well, but they're the little uh, area down in the bottom. And it, they are found only in the country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or Zaire as it was when I started working, within that bend of the Congo River. So where the Congo River comes up and bends around and goes down, it essentially is the divide between on the south you'll have bonobos and on the north you'll have chimpanzees. So they're geographically separated by the Congo River and they, they never overlap and never meet. It's a challenging country to work in. Uh, this, is, um, this is the Congo uh, after the end of, or mm, stability of the civil war that started in 98 and went through to, this was the state in 2003, with uh, a ceasefire between three major elements uh, controlled by different countries, all uh, bringing troops into Congo. Um, this is uh, showing also the major forest blocks. The area where I work is this sausage up here. This is the Lamarco. Um, and uh, it was at first one, at one point in time, it was right on the uh, front line between the Ugandan back troops and the Rwandan back troops. So it's an unstable country. It's a very difficult place to work, uh, but it's a very rewarding place to work as well. So it is also very isolated and very difficult to get to, which translates to expensive to get to. Um, it is also, uh, as it's very remote, it is a place where the animals have survived because there's very low uh, population pressure there. But it takes a, a lot of traveling and, of course, with civil unrest and um, collapse of things like the road system and so on, it's got harder and harder over the years to actually travel in. So we now go by plane, by a small Cessna into the nearest airport, which is, uh, this is us heading in, and that's actually one of my graduate students who got to sit up front uh, this particular time. So heading into the airstrip, you can see our, uh, we're headed over here. Um, to the town of Basankusu, which is a, uh, a Catholic mission, which is on the main river system. And Basankusu, uh, the mission itself, has been there for a very long time uh, and has sort of weathered all the various political unrests. And it's a very good point for us to launch off to head into uh, the interior. From here, so Basankusu is right on the edge of this map in this top left-hand side, and we're heading towards the Lamarco, which is right here. We go in by this river system. This is the Moringa, and then up the Lamarco River. Uh, this area here is the uh, um, protected area, or the, it's not officially protected, but it's an area that the African Wildlife Foundation is working with us to uh, increase the protection for the animals that are there. We used to go in by road, this is when the roads were working, so this was actually a good road. That was our poor little Toyota Land Cruiser, which survived a fair amount of time. Um, the bridges problem with the bridges, um, these are some of the bridges which you have to go on and repair before you actually cross. Actually, these are in the early days. You can see our Land Rover in the back. We started with Bessie the Land Rover. Uh, but now with the collapse of the system, it's all by boat. So it's basically by dugout canoe, which is, uh, this is one of our the main canoes. It has to be fairly large just to take enough fuel for the outboard motors. But it's a relatively long journey starting up the Moringa, which is a relatively large river. Um, it is, there's no centers of population along it, but there are these temporary fishing villages. So when the river is high, people, usually one family, uh, it will build a small village or a few houses where they'll uh, fish the river for the months when the river is relatively high. And as you go further in, it, uh, uh, these dry areas become rarer and rarer. So the, the river basically spreads into the forest, and these are small sandbanks, which are 
you're able to build uh, small fishing huts on, and where you're unable to build the fishing huts, then they're built on stilts directly into the river. But we're traveling in by these canoes, which can take mm, anything from two to five days, depending on the, um, how often you break down and how high the river is. When the river is high, you can go relatively fast. When the river is low, you get snagged on trees a lot or on sandbanks. And uh, it's something that is a very interesting journey, but it, sitting for three to five days in a canoe with the same four or five people can get a bit tiresome by the end. This is two of my graduate students hiding up the end of the boat to stay away from everybody else. I think they've had enough at this point. But once we reach the forest, uh, the Lamarco uh, area, this is our base camp, which is called Delhi. Uh, which is basically a temporary camp that we build, rebuild each year, but it's basically living out of tents. So it's a very uh, non-invasive way of studying animals. There's no electricity or water or any facilities. It's basically a camping in the forest. And um, the uh, facilities are, let us say, a little bit basic. We rely on solar panels for electricity. Uh, cookings around the campfire, which is up on the right, and there's our tents for sleeping and uh, working by candlelight uh, during the evenings. We live on local foods, so this is manioc, which is a cassava root, which is soaking in the river to remove the cyanide, and papayas uh, bought locally. Uh, grubs, of course, are a major staple food. These are large uh, palm boring grubs, very good when fried. And this is a, a boat full of the grubs, the big palm grubs. Very good food. Like, tastes like shrimp. Uh, in the forest itself is relatively undisturbed. It's one of the few areas of, um, it's polyspecific evergreen rainforest. It's undisturbed. It's never been cut. Uh, it's very large trees and absolutely beautiful, with, full with many species of other primates as well as other animals. Uh, there are nine sympatric primate species there, as well as the bonobos. Here's just a few of them. But essentially, it's an undisturbed habitat. There's no people, there's no population in the local area. It's been maintained by uh, local people who live to the south about a day's, to day to two days walk away as a sacred area for them. So that it's a sacred area, there's no hunting and has never been hunting for a very long period of time. And because of this, uh, it's got amazing wildlife, and they're deeply committed to maintaining it. It's a very important part of their uh, local culture. And we work with them to establish agreements to allow us in to conduct research and to stay in this area. And what we do is basically follow bonobos. It's, uh, um, try to get the bonobos used to us, a process that we call habituation. But we don't provision them, we don't give them food or anything like that. We just literally follow them until they get fed up of moving away from us and ignore us completely. But of course, we're doing it on the ground. Um, and this is the modern wonders of uh, GPS, which have just completely and utterly changed our lives in following animals. Now you, you don't get as lost as we used to do. Um, we do a lot of ecological measurements to look at the habitat and look at the, the relationship between the habitat and the way the animals live. So here's, actually that's Nick Malone climbing a fig tree to try and get a diameter. It wasn't no use doing diameter at breast height because of the buttresses on this fruit tree. So he's trying to climb up to get a diameter on this particular tree. We also couldn't do our work without the local people's support, both in terms of allowing us to work in the forest and live there, but also they come and work with us as guides and trackers. So many of them have enormous knowledge about the local plants and animals, and uh, they're invaluable to us as colleagues in uh, following the animals uh, and understanding the various complexities of the rainforest. But the bonobos themselves are rainforest animals. They live mostly up in the trees. 90% of their days are spent up in the trees. They do come to the ground, but it's relatively rare. Um, it's something that in terms of uh, comparing that to a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees do go up into the trees a lot, but they spend most of their time when they prefer to be on the ground. Bonobos uh, prefer to be up in the trees. Just like chimpanzees, they have a very similar diet. It's based on fruit. Uh, this is figs up in the top left. 
a classic tropical fruit. The one down here is a fun one. It's called uh, Traculia africana. It's fun because each fruit weighs between 15 and 20 kilograms. So they're about this big. We always joke when we're in the field that people would say, you know, isn't it dangerous to be in the forest? And we say, yes, our biggest danger is death by fruit. Because when those things fall, you really notice. These have been eaten by bonobos. The one on the left is that looks pale, has actually been gnawed apart, and they sit and they share these in a group. So they're social fruit as well. And they do eat meat. Uh, there's a little diker. Um, there's six species of dikers in the forest, and they do uh, try to eat all of them. But the thing about... Oops. I think I've just dropped the microphone. And trodden on it. My apologies. Let's stick that back on. The... I can't see how this works. Oh, I see. I'm going to do it like that. Is that working? Okay, thank you. The thing about bonobos is that they're, they're almost like the complete opposite to chimpanzees. And that's one of the things that is, is, it is so striking that it is totally surprising. In fact, when we first started watching them, uh, it wasn't known what the social system was, so it took a while before people would even believe it to be true. If you think about chimpanzees being these social, uh, these non-social females that sort of wander around and meet by accident, if you see bonobos, what you'll see is a tight core of females that will never leave each other alone. They're always traveling around together, and when they're separated, they're keeping in contact to find each other. No, I think this is, I've got it on wrong. Here, now, that won't move. It's interesting because then you've got these highly socially bonded females. You tend to get the males then that are socially bonded with females. And it's sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing, one male with one female, rather than groups of males with females. So you get lots of individual partnerships. So instead of being interested in being with males, males are interested in being with females. Unlike the chimpanzees where you'd often see fights over food and the males getting the food first, this site and most of the Congo Basin is a much more productive site. So the trees are much bigger, the food patches are much bigger. There is no fighting over food because food is plentiful. So what you've got essentially is a situation where the females are highly social and in fact if there's any dispute about who's going to feed, the females feed first. And the communities, instead of having aggression between each other based on fighting males going next door and killing each other, instead you have friendly interactions between communities, usually driven by the females again. So when communities meet, the males are a little bit sit in, sit in the back and shout at each other, but the females will just come together and start grooming, and eventually the males give up and just come and be social as well. So you've almost got a, a complete flip of a social system of what happens. The other part is that bonobos have sex all the time. It's an interesting behavior, it's an interesting set of behaviors because it's not just male-female sex. In fact, the most frequent sexual behavior you see in bonobos is female-female sexual interactions. We refer to it as GG rubbing, uh, to stand for genital genital rubbing, and it's a particular behavior that only bonobos really do. They're also, uh, when we say they're doing it constantly, what we mean is sort of if you watch the animals about once every four to five hours, you'll see at least one sexual interaction. That's an unbelievably high rate for watching primates. If you'd watched chimpanzees and ever saw a mating, you'd be very lucky uh, because female chimpanzees are only ovulating about once every four to five years because that's how long it takes them to rear an offspring. So this frequency of sexual behavior is also happening whether the female's ovulating, whether she's pregnant, whether she's lactating. At any stage, she is willing to mate. She's willing to mate with males. She's willing to have sex with other females. There's also male-male sex. It's not as common, uh, but it does happen. It's especially frequent between young males and juveniles and infants. Um, we refer to it as penis fencing, which I think is a, a reasonably good description. Uh, 
it's sort of a friendly social interaction, the way that it's generally been described is sort of like as important as a handshake. That is, individuals are having uh, sex in uh, at every occasion. But when you start to look at it, actually, it's not in every occasion. There are certain things and certain times when sex happens. Um, they're also highly innovative. So uh, one of the questions that often would come up when people would look at bonobos is that uh, people were looking for tool use because chimpanzees use tools and manufacture a tool set. And the question was, well, you know, do bonobos use tools as well? And we're like, yes, they use tools. We watch them make tools. And they're like, oh, do they termite fish? And the answer is not so much, um, not really. Well, what sort of tools are they making? They make sex tools <laughs> because they're bonobos. <laughs> so we get a lot of interesting interactions, and especially this one that happens between females. This is the Gigi rubbing, right? This is a zoo picture because it, it shows it really clearly. I've got some clips for you to look at to see some of these behaviors happening uh, both in the wild and, and some clips taken from uh, taken uh, at the Columbus Zoo of the group there. But this shows you the sort of classic Gigi rubbing posture. We've got two females, right? Now they're staring into each other's eyes. That's very significant. Most primates don't stare into each other's eyes. That's a threat unless it's something that's very friendly. So a tight social bonding. Usually in most primates, it's only between mothers and infants. But in bonobos, it's between all individuals. They're giving a classic bared teeth grin uh -uh, and a sex scream at the same time, which in deference to your ears, I won't imitate. <laughs> uh, there's one female usually stands, or at least usually it's done up in the trees, so she's the one holding on. The other female grasps the first female around the hips and then around the shoulders, and then if you look towards the back, you can see some big, in this case, gray things. Those are big pink things. That's the female sexual swelling. And they rub their hips from side to side to rub the front of the sexual swellings, which in the case of a bonobo is an enlarged clitoris. So they're rubbering, rubbing their clitorides, to be technical, clitorises, as was, we'll go with clitorises, it's easier, together. And this sexual behavior can last 30 seconds to a minute and you compare that, say, to a male-female mating, which is six seconds at best. So these are long social interactions that are highly friendly. This bared teeth grimace and scream is the same bared teeth grimace and scream the male gives at ejaculation. So as a sexual behavior, it's very tightly involved in, in social bonding between especially females. But again, you've got a lot of male-female bonding going on as well. And it happens under particular circumstances. So it's very much tied to food, right? So it's interesting. So it's, uh, you often will watch these animals. Here's a female here. You can see the pink sexual swelling that they have. Bonobos, unlike chimpanzees, maintain a sexual swelling throughout their sexual cycle. So even if they are not ovulating, they're still relatively swollen. It does get bigger at ovulation, so you can tell, but they're always relatively swollen, especially as adults. But what typically happens is the females enter the fruit tree. They then have GG rubbing, lots of female-female sexual behavior, and then they feed. And in fact, if you look at the frequency of GG rubbing, what you find is they, they have these sexual interactions. They GG rub a certain amount, and they GG rub more if they're going to take more food out of that fruit tree in the following feeding bout. So it's not going in, eating all the food, finding there's lots of it, and then GG rubbing. They're going in, and before anybody feeds, they all GG rub. Then they eat. And what, from what we can tell, it's very much tied to making allies and friends. So GG rubbing happens, happens most between females who are most friendly to each other, if they're separated, they'll call each other back in, right? So they, they stay together and they call each other to food. They also then will keep others out of a tree. So one group of females, which of course we call a clique of females, will then sit in a tree and keep others out. And the ones who are working together to keep the other females out keep Gigi rubbing with each other. It's part of their, I'm going to back you up, you're going to back me up, yes, okay, well, well then we'll have sex, just to confirm the deal. Okay, so what are the males doing? Well, when you've got females in a group, 
And these groups of females are sort of three to five females in a particular group, plus their infants and their juveniles. It's quite easy for a single male to stay with that group and keep other males away. In other words, it no longer pays the males to work together to defend the whole range. They're much better just working on their own to, to look after a small group of females. Right? So it's become a little cluster that they can monopolize. It's essentially, from an evolutionary perspective, there's no longer an advantage to males forming tight friendships, so you don't get any. But you get other effects. So in bonobos, as in chimpanzees, the males stay in the group they're born into. So this social bonding between females is among females that have moved into the group. They're all unrelated to each other. But the males in the group are the ones that are born there, which means if a male hangs out with his mother, she's going to be Gigi rubbing with potential mates. And what you see is that mothers are important in helping sons to gain sexual access to other unrelated females. So not only is it a group of females you can protect, but your mother is now making dates for you and introducing you to lots of other females. And essentially what you have is if you see any sort of fighting going on, it's disputes between males to protect areas where females are going to go. So what often happens if it's, let's say, a great big fruit tree, but the females aren't there yet, the males will run ahead, have a squabble, because it's not a, a knock-down, drag-out fight like it would be in chimpanzees. One male, the dominant male, kicks all the other males out of the fruit tree. The winning male sits in the best access route and then mates with all the females as they arrive. Right? So it's a solitary male strategy. There isn't an advantage to individual males to bond together to protect a lot of females. You can have alternate strategies. So as in all mating systems, you can have more than one way of doing it. A male sometimes pair up with a female to wander off and sneakily mate away from others. Those sorts of things happen just like they happen in chimpanzees as well. What you essentially have then is females who are socially bonded, males are typically alone, and the females have then all the power because they're always together in a group. So when we look at them socially, what we see is that the females as a group outrank the individual males. So you don't see the male dominance that you see in chimpanzees. You have to be careful how you say that because if you had a one male meet one female fight, which sometimes happens, but it's rare, the male will win because he's bigger. But the females are almost never alone. So it's usually a gang of females with a solitary male Male aggression is not a good strategy under those circumstances. So essentially what you have then when they're feeding is the males will fight over the food tree, but then when the females arrive, the females feed, and the males sit outside the tree and wait till they're done. So the females are basically winning without any fighting, and they also get to do things like control valuable foods like meat. They don't have to give it away to the males. One other thing, this is sort of a technical detail, but it's really interesting that one of the extensions we've got from this then is that not only are the females uh, not susceptible to male aggression, but they actually then turn it around and start intervening into male aggressions. So we see what is called policing behavior. That is showing, this shows you a graph of individuals intervening into fights between males. Right, and these are two types of fights. The, t the, the darker bars on top are aggressive fights, so literally knock down, drag out, bites and uh, fights where individuals get hurt. The ones below are mild aggression, sort of slaps and screams at each other. So this is cases where uh, individuals were fighting, and then across the bottom, it's who's doing the intervention. And it's a policing intervention, which means that the individual who's intervening goes up to the fighting two, breaks them apart, doesn't enter the fight on one individual side or the other, just is totally neutral, stop fighting the both of you, sit down and be quiet. And it's mostly done by adult females who are going in and breaking up these male fights. Also, what's also interesting is that juvenile females do it too. So they're learning how to be bosses, that they're going in and breaking up these individual fights. It's also interesting, if you look at what chimpanzees do, chimpanzees also do interventions, that is one individual coming into a fight. But what happens in chimpanzees, it's usually a male 
intervening into a male-male fight, and he comes in on the side of one of the males to help it win. So if you change it around, what you've done is you've got a social system where aggression rarely escalates. It often gets diffused very quickly. It either gets diffused like this by breaking up fights, or it gets diffused in, the, in many cases in bonobos through sexual interactions. Essentially then, what you've got in bonobos, but not chimpanzees, is we've got sex for friendship, right? Sex for forming alliances. It's extended sexuality without any hint of monogamy whatsoever. And it's sexuality among females, it's between males and females, but also among males as well, and mothers helping sons with access to unrelated females. So the nice thing about the bonobo is it basically is the last part of tearing this larger hypothesis down. Right? It's essentially saying that you can't say extended sexuality is associated with monogamy uh, for con uh, and extended sex is associated with concealed ovulation. We know that one doesn't work, but we also know that sex happens for many reasons, but where it happens to the same level that it happens in humans, in bonobos, it's all about the social part. It's all about social bonding and less about reproduction. And I thought I would uh, end with, if you having a look at some uh, bonobos actually doing things, there's, there's no sound, or rather I should say there's embarrassing sound on some of these. Um, some of these are, so uh, these, this is essentially just bonobos interacting. This is uh, down on, uh, they're down on the ground and they're excited at this point, but you can see they're all reaching out to uh, touch each other and be reassured. There's a male in the middle, there's a face-to-face uh, -face mating that's just breaking up again, a very common interaction. There's a Gigi rubbing happening right at the end. Um, I'm sure that's a very short clip. We've got also some uh, clips. These are taken at uh, the Columbus Zoo. Uh, this is a, a fun set of um, videos that we have that are taken around this. Again, this is that artificial termite mound. But this is a really, um, it's a, a very a fascinating place to the animals. They want to get to it, they want to get the food out. This is Lola, who's a fe young female. Uh, she actually lost her stick in the hole and had to go and get another one. And we've got a young male who's around there bothering her. Females are much better at getting food out of the termite mound than are males. And uh, we're sorry about the poor quality. This is just taken from the viewing station. The interesting thing is that along comes some other individuals. So Lola is the main female there. Um, these are two others that are basically bothering her, but she's kind of ignoring them. And in a minute, along will come Unga. Unga is the dominant female of the group. Now, Unga looks at, there's one of Unga's offspring, there's Jerry coming, and then we'll get, we'll get Gander, who's the older one, and then Unga arrives. Unga is an old female, and many bonobos and chimpanzees in, in zoos overgroom. So Unga looks a bit funny because a lot of her hair is pulled out. And when she arrives, you can see that um, her, her interaction with Lola is, is very friendly, but you also see, sort of warning you to watch for it fairly quickly, is that because Unger and Lola are friendly, it also provides uh, the possibility for Unger's male sons to mate with Lola as well. So right at about two minutes, so as they move in, okay, here's the male still. Now, they, you can see she's coming from down this end, and she's the dominant female, so everybody backs off as she comes in. And here's Unga. Unga's got a relatively large swelling, right? And you can kind of see her head is fairly bald where she's overgroomed. She's checking out some of the holes in the termite mound. Here comes her son coming in. She's got two sons. One's relatively big and older, and the other one's much younger. Here she goes around to Lola. So she's sitting around the other side of Lola. They're going to say hello with a Gigi rub right there, right? So there are two of them are Gigi rubbing. And it's quite common for the dominant of the two females to be the one standing and then they're going to go back to feeding and then in, in comes Jerry and he wants to mate so he has a quick mating with Lola right so essentially her interactions with the individuals change when Unger arrives right so not only are is Unger as a dominant female then essentially being very friendly with Lola and they're not fighting over it they're sharing quite nicely uh, but then essentially what you've got is sexual access to other individuals provided by 
uh, having your mother be friends with other females. Um, and I shall let this run for a while. It's just a lot of sexual interactions and termite and fishing in the termite mound, which is rather fun. But thank you very much for your attention. very good question and nobody really knows. Um, during, the, during the war, during the Civil War, uh, a lot of them were killed. So um, we, being very isolated, did not lose a single animal, which was wonderful. But uh, at another study site at a place called Wamba, where a Japanese group works, they had six communities of individuals and they lost three of them completely. They were hunted and killed for bushmeat. Um, so it, it has been a big question. Everyone has been asking and trying to work, how many, uh, work out how many there are. Estimates range from about four to 5,000 up to 10 to 15,000, based on looking at forest types that are available. But bonobos are very hard to watch and they're relatively shy and they'll avoid people. So in areas where there's been bushmeat hunting or poaching, they just will not go around where people are. They know how to avoid them. Uh, and it's, it is a big question. We actually don't know the answer, but it's not very many. There are not many in captivity either. They're relatively rare. There's only a few zoos that have enough to have a relatively large social group like this. So the Columbus Zoo is a, a really nice one because they, they really manage the group nicely and give them a really large, out there's nice GG rubbing going on, a uh, large outdoor enclosure like this. Yeah. I had one regarding uh, how the females stop the conflict in the group, mm -hmm. and if it's through sexual access, if whether the juvenile females are fertile at this point, or... Right. Yeah, they, the way they stop fights is literally to aggress against the fight. So they'll go screaming into the fight. So if two, in, two males are fighting, they just run straight at them and break them apart. And they don't, they do it impartially. So it, after the fight, there isn't like one male says, oh, she's on my side, I can win. It's literally stop it and stop all aggressing completely. And she will then usually interact with both of them, either groom them or have sex with them separately. Um, with the, the, these juvenile females, they're, they're not fertile. Chimpanzees and bonobos are similar to humans in that they are not sexually mature until for a female about 13 years of age. So the ones here, uh, Little Jerry's only uh, three or four in this, uh, and Gander, who's older, is about six or seven, but he's nowhere near adult. Uh, so when a full adult would be 10 to 13 years of age, a female will start ovulating at that point. Uh, but a male, a male won't really be successful in mating until he's socially able to. So in the wild, typically, a male becomes sufficiently socially connected to mate at around anything from 15 to 20 years of age. Uh, they could physiologically mate. So in the zoos, for example, if they have only one male and he's young, 10 years old, uh, it's possible with you know, all the feeding that they do that he could be a fertile male. But in the wild, you wouldn't see that. Do you have a question? Hey, Lauren. Um, I just had a brief question about the overgrooming. Mm -hmm. It's boredom. It's very much boredom. It is also, it's interesting because it's spread culturally. So in, certain individuals in certain zoos will overgroom, and then if they get moved to a group that doesn't overgroom, overgrooming starts. And it's, um, it's hair pulling. So they, they, instead of just grooming, they're literally pulling the hair out until it gets to the point that it doesn't grow back. So you see a lot of bald chimpanzees and bonobos because they are bored essentially they don't have enough interesting things even with you know all of this going on um it's essentially boredom yes they are it is yes essentially it we think it's the food distribution so it's, it it to be a chimpanzee um Let's put it this way. If you put a bonobo in a chimpanzee habitat, they would not work very well because the females would stay together. The food is not in great big lumps like it is in the Congo Basin. The food trees are small. 
So the females are forced to be split apart and, and range solitary. It, as you get down into the Congo, so we're right on the equator, right in the Congo Basin. It's a very productive area, very fertile area. The trees are enormous. The fruit trees are abundant. There's also no extended dry season. It's basically uh, a very short dry season. Dry season means it rains every other day as opposed to every day. So it's highly productive. There's always enough food that allows females to stay together. And in general, what it is sort of like, you can think of chimpanzees are like bonobos that have been, where the females have been forced to spit apart. They can't stay together, but then they also don't have that mechanism to stay together. It's also really interesting that this is sort of from an evolutionary perspective over time, the split between chimps and bonobos is somewhere around two million years ago, depending on who you argue with. Um, but if you look at them genetically, they're both equally related to humans. We have a lot of gene genetic uh, coding in common. But if in certain areas, if you line up the DNA, you can actually see differences where certain sections are deleted from chimpanzees that are maintained in humans and bonobos. And some of those genes have been identified to be associated with social bonding. So it's kind of suggesting that chimpanzees have lost the ability to be a bonobo, uh, and, but humans still have retained it. Mm -hmm. In your, me, in your study, was there a, a need to handle them? No, we don't. Well, <laughs> not during the actual research. So one of the, uh, we, we maintain distance, and you have to maintain distance from primates, especially apes that are closely related to us, because we can give them diseases. Uh, there have been problems in many of the study sites. Gombe is a good example where people have given the chimpanzees measles or pneumonia and animals have died because of the diseases they catch from people. We never get closer. We have a, a general rule of no closer than 10 meters to the animals. Uh, and usually it's a lot further than that because they're 200 feet up in the trees. But having said that, we do help and are involved in confiscation programs. So where uh, people have hunted animals and taken the babies as pets or as status symbols, uh, we help go and uh, offer to take those animals and put them into sanctuaries so that uh, they're essentially not you know, reared in little cages as pets, but given at least a chance to be in a larger social group. And that's the only time I've ever personally handled bonobos is when we've done these confiscations. <laughs>